don't see how we can make bigger enemies. So you become like the sort of Tony Scarface of podcasting. to the morning show so glad to have you back the morning show <laughs> <laughs> have you guys gone over to patreon.com slash pantelis if you haven't so uh please do so because there's a bunch of content being pumped out of that channel uh you can find the subscription that best fits your needs also go to uh Tomalovax patreon the episode we did of couple ouvert oh, in yeah. uh, saint Eustache is officially out on his patreon if you guys want to watch that shit, it was fun. Uh, go take a look at that. Yeah, I saw some, clips. Some it looks, clips uh, looks like out. you guys had a blast. Over yeah, there. yeah, we had That's a blast. That's Kamal Levac or Coupe Louvain? Coupe Louvain and... Uh, the Patreon. I'm not going to spoil it, but there was a moment towards the end of the show. It was, was kind of wacky. Also, if you're at the corner of Chavanel and Saint Laurent, I'll be panhandling. I'm trying to organize a drink. I would appreciate any <laughs> spare change that you can... Throw my way. <laughs> of course, you can subscribe on this channel, on the Pantelis YouTube comedy channel. So much content, guys, coming out of here. Um, a lot of content, like Standing By, the Terry and Ted podcast, which is going to be airing soon. Speaking of which, we have an amazing show this morning, guys. A huge surprise to all of you and uh, a giggly little moment for me as a, as a, as a young boy listening to Show Me FM passionately. we got Terry DeMonte in studio. Hi. <laughs> you How call you? it a morning show and it starts at 10 o'clock? <laughs> Come on. Well, it's still morning, it's technically. The, it's, 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 morning it's the morning show started at 5.30, boys. It's <laughs> late morning, late morning. Yeah. It's kind of the latest. The when we get up show. Yeah. It's up the when the we crack get up show. Ten. Talk, about a, talk about a generational gap over here. Right? <laughs> morning at 5, what? <laughs> <laughs> so happy to, to meet you, uh, Thank you George. Terry. Thanks for having me. With, uh, and, uh, I, and I gotta tell you, and I told you. I told Ted this, and I've been telling Poseidon and Pantelis and everyone over here at the studio um, how thrilled I was when Pantelis told us that. Oh man, we went and got Terry and Ted. They're gonna be starting a podcast, and I was like. Uh, uh, Terry and Ted. Who? What do you mean, Terry and Ted? <laughs> I mean, you, you can't, you can't, you don't imagine that it's the Terry and Ted, right? He's like Terry and Ted. I'm like, no, I know who Terry and Ted is. It's that Terry and Ted, or there's just another uh, team. Another like, no, no. I initially thought it was Tom and Jerry, bro. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no, no, the Terry and Ted. I was like, what? That's so uh, amazing. That's very kind of you, George. Thank you. It's very flattering. Uh, you're uh, you're recording uh, your new episodes. Uh, when is we that are. show uh, going uh, live Our again? Our first episode will arrive October the 25th, and uh, what we do is we're on a weekly basis, so uh, a new episode every Wednesday, and I know podcast pros or consultants say, you shouldn't call them seasons. Yeah, well, we do. Um, we're on season six, and every time there's a new season, there's 10 or 11 new episodes, and they come out every Wednesday, and um, it's uh, going to start October the 25th. Uh, we got a nice lineup of guests. Pretty excited about it, and nice. I just, you know, Ted and I had we were so lucky. We spent so many years together on the radio and had so much fun. And then when the radio thing stopped, it was really nice for me for about four or five months. I guess I had a really nice rest, and then I got itching to find a microphone again. And God love uh, uh, Pantelis and Mike Ward. They 
they called us and we came down here to the uh, the studios and they said, you guys should be doing a podcast, man. You should be doing a podcast. And we were skeptical, to be honest with you. And um, we did a season and, you know, we got some sponsors and and it took off. And it, and it's a, you know, it's a small podcast. It's not as big as Mike Ward's or Pantelis's. It's a Montreal focused podcast, you know, much like this morning show is, I guess. Um, but we're, we've been really surprised and pleased, uh, about, uh, how it's gone. And we're going to, today we're going to talk about phone addiction. <laughs> you know what? The reason I'm doing, I'm trying, I'm trying to post on Twitter and on okay. Facebook that we're live right now oh, okay. and I can't find George's Twitter. Uh, oh, okay. I th- I thought I thought Ted, Ted Ted and I were just talking in the he, in the truck on the way over. He said, "Yeah, I'm addicted to my phone." Yeah, yeah, sure. No, I'm actually. I'm, this is actually work I'm doing right now. I understand. What is your what's, see, what's this your is, tag? This is, this is what is your problem? Yeah. GTS. Okay, why mm-hmm. doesn't it come up? The dirty dog. A N G T S. Okay, you guys do the show, and I'll find. All it. right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, uh, see, I, I just want to go back to what you're saying about, you know, the, the seasons, this, and you can't, the good thing about podcasting is that you can do whatever the hell you want. Yeah, then that's the thing, uh, you know, I, I, I thought, because I, we only are able to get together twice a year, um, and which is plenty, I think, um, because I'm in British Columbia, so we have to organize it, we have to book the guests, I got to book flights, I got to find a hotel, um, that kind of thing, so, uh, you know, we... We, because we're not doing it every every week like you guys are with the morning show, I thought, well, we'll call them seasons and we'll we'll let people know when new episodes are coming by yeah. saying season six is yeah. going to arrive I October twenty fifth. I think so. I think people follow along. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How are you guys enjoying uh, the space? Lo- absolutely love it. Um, one of the things about uh, you know podcasting is a lot of people do it. You know, I have a little studio at my house with a roadcaster and. It works fine, but there's nothing like, you know, a studio like this with proper microphones and equipment, and you can sit across from each other. It's a, it reminds us of of a old school radio yeah. studio, you know, and I, I think that's part of it. I used to say, what happens in the hallways and the studio comes through the speakers mm. um, when we were in radio, and I think the same thing is true of here. It's a it's a really nice space, and more importantly, um, the people are amazing. You know, Poseidon, Pantelis, Mike Ward, um, you know, everybody's been so helpful and uh, the facilities are really, really nice. I, I really, I get excited when we have to come to the studio. It reminds me of my early days of radio. It's amazing because, you know, we, we started the, pod, uh, the, the the morning show initially during the pandemic. It was Pantelis. He was probably bored at home. He's like, guys, what are you doing? Let, let's just start something uh, together. And we, we're doing the four of us with, with Phil uh, back in the day. Uh, and it's fun, right? I mean, you're in the comfort of your own house, but uh, I get what you're saying. The idea of actually coming and seeing people <laughs> and sitting yeah, yeah, in the yeah. same room yeah. and exchanging, the, the, you can't beat that. No, it's so different, and everybody knows this, and, and I, I, I think the same is true in business. You know, there's a, a big difference between sitting across a table yeah. from somebody and sharing a drink or some food um, and staring at them in a Zoom screen or a Skype, uh, Skype yeah. meeting. Yeah. But I mean, shows. Okay, I'm ready. Are we on yet? <laughs> when do we When do we go on? <laughs> Jesus Murphy, old man, Did old you? man bird here. Uh, how do you, you, you know, work that as well as you do an elevator? Tell them the elevator story. Yesterday, we, we were Poseidon was with us. We were we were leaving the studio yesterday, and Ted was trying to close the. Um, Oh, yeah. <laughs> close, close, use the closed door button. On the elevator here in the and building. He, he was pushing on the metal panel. <laughs> he was he was hunched over like an 80-year-old man going, is this the, you got the closing thing And, here? like, the button right there says closed door, and I'm pushing on the metal part with the two little arrows. <laughs> yes. Wow. Oh, my God. Yeah, and then I almost drove us into a head-on collision later on in the day. <laughs> also fun. Doing my imitation of an old man driving, <laughs> yeah. I almost ran head-on into a taxi. <laughs> That's funny. Hey, there's uh, there's uh, some money that came in in the chat there, uh, Poseidon. Oh. We got people's in the chat? throwing dollar reduce. Probably Captain. somebody Terry and I owe money <clears throat> to. <laughs> See all those fucking guys. Now, how does this work? Captain people, people Yolo. just fling money at you? Is that the way that works? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, the right. more articles of clothing you remove, the more money they throw. Wow. There you go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Captain Yolo 562 uh, dropped 10 big ones in the chat. 
To Terry and Ted, please bring on Bill and Mitsumi from the CFCF 12 days. Oh, yeah, from the from the grapes yeah. of the round table. Yeah, on thank your you, man. Podcast. Would love to hear of their experience on Pulse News and working at 405 Ogilvy. Ogilvy. Or Ogilvy. Yeah. Ogilvy. Yeah. <laughs> it's in Park X. You know where you're yeah. Yeah. 405 you're born, Ogilvy grew up and where yeah. you still live? <laughs> I, I always said Ogilvy. Ogilvy? Really? <laughs> wow. What's the matter with you? <laughs> okay. I think it's my mother. <laughs> Thank you, man. We, um, I'll see if we can, uh, we can arrange. We've already had Bill on the podcast. No, we haven't. Bill Brownstein? No, she said he said Hoagland. Oh, Hoagland. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So well, see, it that, says that, Bill that, and Mitsumi. I'm assuming okay. it's Hoagland. Okay, yeah. that, that's, a, that's a tough order. <laughs> yeah, Bill is long retired. Yeah, isn't, he, do isn't in, he down in? Uh, yeah, he's Bill. Vermont? Hoagland, yeah, he, no, he's in Ontario now. Okay, and he was uh, the one that lived in Vermont and would commute all yeah, day every, every day. day. Yeah, it was it was actually I thought it was kind of cool. And Bill would go back and forth every day. That's a commute, Jeez. and he w- one of the good things though, and this is pre nine eleven, he got to know the guys at the well, the border, sure. and sure. the you know the American guys and the Canadian guys would go. Morning, Bill. And then just, you know, wave, wave him around. That's so funny. Yeah, it was, he was, I mean, back then, everybody watched Pulse News or CTV News as it later became called. But, I mean, you have to love knew. Montreal to another level to accept having to drive from Vermont every day <laughs> yeah, into Montreal. Yeah, I, mean, I, I get upset at everything and everyone when I have to cross the bridge to come into <laughs> Montreal from the South Shore. <laughs> Speaking of which, this morning, and I was thinking about it, uh, because, you know, we've bashed Montreal a lot on the morning show. Uh, maybe rightfully so, because a lot of things that don't work. Yes, rightfully well, so. Well, it's the Dingbat mayor. Yeah. She has taken Ding Battery to uh, a whole new level yeah. of Dingbatness, that but one. Th- but this morning, I'm crossing over the bridge, and it's a clear day. There's not a cloud in the sky. You're the on the sh- Champlain? On the Champlain, and the sun is shining. And I'm looking at the buildings, and, you know, it's the, 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 the sun is reflecting on... It's a beautiful city we live in. Yeah, it's such and a I, great. That's a great view from the bridge. It's so yeah. beautiful, uh, and I'm like, God damn, look, this city's beautiful. Why do we complain? And then I just thought of everything else. I'm like, no, no, we're well, right to complain. Nits, yeah, we, there are always nits to pick, but mm. but some of the nits that we pick here are like it, there's no end to, for example, the construction. We're coming across town this morning oh, from God. Terry's Hotel in Dorval, mm. and and we hit at least two construction zones where all of a sudden. Whether it's the Met or Cremazy or Cote de Lies, all of a sudden it narrows down to one lane. There are no construction workers anywhere to no. be seen. Mm. And you always get the arseholes who come all the way up and then cut in at the last minute. And it's just, it's annoying. It's well, annoying. There, and there's, there's never any enforcement. There's never any cops. No, there should be and cops there who we, are handing we've out We've been tickets. having this conversation, at least I have, on the radio for the last 20, 25 years. It never ever changes it's never going to change and no matter where you go last night ted was at the bordell uh, the comedy club mm. so through the through the tunnel around ontario um downtown st catherine st catherine east st catherine west uh dorval um the met it doesn't matter to carry we yeah. we, we went to literacy the other day we had to take me up to carry it doesn't matter where you go there's orange signs, orange cones. It, I know the city's older. I know projects have to be done. But there's such a lack of coordination. And we've been begging for years as Montrealers to get it coordinated. And the reality is they don't give a shit. They absolutely don't give a shit. They're too busy building... Um, sponge roads. Sponge roads and virtue signaling projects. Closing roads, open pedestrian walkways trying to save the planet instead of running the city. Yeah. So on a daily basis, the city doesn't really function as well as it should or could, because in my opinion, the people who are responsible for that are distracted by their pet projects. So if you're stuck in traffic, to hell with you, I've got to make sure that we're all using wooden forks. <laughs> and paper straws. Yeah. yeah. And, and honestly, I mean, that's... <laughs> That's true. You can say what you want about the mayor, you know, and, you know, you can be on her side or against her, but that's really what her, that's really what she'll be remembered for. She'll be remembered for her climate-based projects, you know, her closing roads, pedestrian walkways, bike lanes, making sure there's nowhere to park, you know, those are all things yeah. that 
a mayor of a major metropolis, Canada's second biggest city, should be focusing on making sure the city runs for the citizens. But they're they're now, and not not just in Montreal; it's everywhere. Mm. You know, out out west where I live, it's the same thing in Vancouver. The mayors of the cities are focused on making sure they look like they're in on saving the planet, or you know, making sure they're on the right side of morality, and and instead of like. And Can we make sure the garbage is picked up? Yeah. Can we make sure the roads practicality are? is yeah, not, well, that's a what, that's what it's mayor, not a priority. That's what mayors used to do. Yeah. Mayors used to make sh- yeah. you know you, mayors used to run and say, "I will make the trains run on time. I will make sure the city's clean. I will make sure the city's crime free." But and, uh, that, that, it doesn't happen anymore. And I would argue that their pro climate agenda, with what they're doing, is counterintuitive to better the climate. Because now I, you get rid of all the parking spots, you got to drive around more. You cause more traffic. Uh, the, you know, idea, the idea people, for that know, is just ditch your car altogether. Well, yeah, that, yeah. that's yeah. what they'd like. Yeah, yeah that's but, what but, I, that's but it's impossible. It's impossible. I said to Ted the other day, look at that. The the um, uh, the two eleven went by us on the twenty, and people are cheek to jowl standing. Yeah. And breathing each other's garlic breath, <laughs> like right next to each other. And I understand it. I used to have to take the bus. Yeah. And people who have to take the bus have to take the bus. But I now have a choice. Would I choose to ride the 211 to get home if I didn't have to? No, no. Je pense pas. No, no. No. So I, and I understand that's the idea. We should all leave our car at home. And when I, when I, I used to live in NDG, about 500 yards from the Villa Maria Metro. Mm. And I used the Metro all the time. Yeah. Because it was easy, it was convenient, and it was actually stupid to try and drive my car from NDG to, you know, the Quartier des Spectacles. Yeah. I, it was just much easier to take, you know, For go sure. down the driveway, go to Villa Maria Metro, and, and get off at Place des mm-hmm. Arts. Um, so if you make it convenient and you make it work for people, I think they'll do it. Mm-hmm. But do I want to get on the 211 or the 105 on Sherbrooke at 5 o'clock in the afternoon? Yeah. I do not. I don't. How, um, I mean, you've been such a staple for for the people in Montreal. Both of you have. I mean, Ted is still in Montreal. Yeah. But this decision to go out west, I mean, what is that all about? Well, well, what's that all about? Yeah. What's the matter with uh, you? What's your problem? <laughs> <laughs> you got people being a little confrontational there, George. <laughs> it's the what's we do in this West business? <laughs> <laughs> no, George, I'm just poking fun. I because it's a legitimate question. Born and raised Montrealer, yeah. and absolutely, you know, I've always had a love hate relationship with the city, which I think a lot of people do. Which is normal. It's natural yeah, too. You, I love it. Well we just we just had it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. just now. Yeah. It's Canada's most interesting city. It's Canada. It has an electricity and a joy that no other city in the country has. Um, but it also is the biggest pain in the ass to live here. You know you just said it yourself. Yeah, coming, literally coming from the South Shore is, you know, you're like, look how beautiful this is. Ha, hey, fuck. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> you know, the city's so great. Come on, yes. <laughs> it's you know, it's like the it's a typical Montreal reaction. And I I got my start. I left Montreal when I was a kid. I was I think I was 19. I went out to Manitoba. I really enjoyed my time in Manitoba. Churchill. He started yeah. in Churchill on the on the shores of Hudson Bay. Yeah. yeah. Where and they had polar bear warnings. Yeah, so you'd morning. have to check the radio to see yeah. what the polar bear situation was. So I, I, I started, you know, I started out there and I spent time in Winnipeg and really enjoyed Manitoba. Then I came back to Montreal, and in 2008 I went back out to Calgary because I got a great offer to go to Calgary and spent more time there. And when it came time to leave the microphone at the radio station, I was tired. I was burned out. I was fed up. I didn't want to talk about politics anymore. I didn't want to hear another goddamn story about the goddamn language fight. Mm. I didn't want to hear any more talk about separation. I didn't want to drive anymore on the bad, you know, like all of the stuff that we complain about built up and built up. Mm. And my wife, Jess, absolutely adored British Columbia, and I did too. And anybody who's been out there knows how beautiful it is. Um, we, We thought, you know what, we need a change. And I'm not afraid of change, and I love new chapters. And we're like, fuck it, we're going. Let's just. Is your go. wife from out west? No, she's from Saint Agathe. Oh, okay. And she's francophone. Okay. 
So it, you know, and, you know, it, it was, it was something we talked about and we were excited about and we looked forward to. And, um, and when you're burned out like that, you block out all of the good about the city and you forget it. You know, you only focus on the bad. And when we, when we left, we were like, ah, oh, never coming back here. And then, you know, we started to come back for the podcast and then Jess and I, you know, we calmed down and we have a quieter, yeah. quieter lifestyle and, and BC is boring. And, <laughs> you know, so we started to talk about things that we missed. So, um, it was, I guess it was a rea- it wasn't a reactionary move. We were looking for change. Yeah. And sometimes you have to do it. Like it just makes you feel good because you can't be building, building up all that anger and all that angst. And uh, yeah, and we were lucky. We, you know, we were lucky we could do it. Yeah. You know, we, we had the means to pack up and try something new. And, uh, and I know not everybody does. A lot of people, you know, can't even think of doing something like that. And, uh, you know, it was exciting and it, it's fun and it makes life interesting. And, you know, I think it's nice to have different exposures to different because the country is so big. And so different, especially on the other side of the Rockies. Mm. People in British Columbia think on a north-south. People in British Columbia relate more to Oregon, Washington, and California. And they never talk about or think about the east. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah, because uh, it's part of the same country. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but you you know when you travel the country, and if you've traveled the country, you know it's so big, so yeah. vast, and the cultural differences, you know, from the time you make the turn uh, at the Great Lakes towards Thunder Bay, and you leave the Canadian Shield, and you get to Manitoba, and the prairies begin to roll, and you drive through Saskatchewan, and then, you know, the folks in Saskatchewan and Alberta are a little similar, but really different, and once you go over the Rocky Mountains. It's completely different. I'd love to do the drive. You've never done it. I highly recommend it. You've done it a number of times. eh? Yeah. I've done the train, but that but the train too I've heard. But I was asleep for half of it. Yeah. (laughs) Seriously, because I had a sleeper car. So the drive is the drive is really if you've never done it and you love the country, I love the country. You know, and there there's there are moments along the drive, you know, you after you go through Wawa and you come up towards the Great Lakes and you're driving through woods and then you drive up a hill. And come around a corner, and they're superior spilled out in front of you. Wow. You know, and you, you know, you you get like, oh, Canada! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the pride just kicks in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The pride kicks in. Yeah, it's really cool. I yeah, highly, you need, but highly you need, recommend it. You need time, and you need a fellow traveler yeah, too. You, you yeah, wouldn't want to do you it do. yourself. Yeah, yeah. and a you great wanna, soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You yeah. want to split that drive. Yeah. Oh God. Um, I just want to get back to uh, last episode because um, I've been getting messages and uh, people that have been calling and commenting on how uh, impactful it was and how uh, refreshing it was uh, to bring someone to, to, to have that perspective on the conflict happening uh, in the Middle East. Uh, it was a great idea, uh, Ted, to bring on uh, uh, Jeff Kovac. Jeff. Yeah, Jeff is, uh, Jeff is a Montrealer of the Jewish faith who lived in Israel and served in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, and and brought uh, a perspective of someone who who's been there on the ground and knows the lay of the land. And I thought brought a very balanced and moderate perspective mm-hmm. as well. He spoke openly about his affinity for and empathy for the Palestinian people. He said ninety percent of them are lovely people, but there's ten percent who are indoctrinated into uh, and these are my words and I'm paraphrasing what he said, but basically into an Islamic death cult. Mm-hmm. And they want to kill all the Jews. Yeah. And he said that 10% makes 99% of the noise. And I said, well, why don't we hear from the 90%? And he said, because they're too afraid. Yeah. They're too afraid of the consequences if they speak out. Anyway, I thought it was a very balanced perspective. It was very nice. And, uh, and it did get good feedback uh, on my social media platforms as well. Good, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, and, and I just thought maybe we can do like a quick little follow up on what's happening there. Of course, I mean, we're not going to dwell on it. I mean, it's sad to see the developments, but there are developments and it seems as though they're going to continue uh, to be. This is not going to be a, a conflict that seems to, to end uh, uh, soon. Uh, Israel is um, is preparing for a ground uh, invasion or a ground attack. Uh, they're, uh, they, they've uh, they've amassed, I think, over three hundred fifty thousand reservists that have uh, that have come into the army, and they're preparing uh, to go in. The idea is to completely annihilate Hamas and to just just cut off its head. Uh, 
Uh, of course, you know, sadly, the collateral damage is uh, is just devastating to watch. They've leveled Palestine with bombs. Uh, yesterday, there was a hospital that was bombed, and immediately everyone went out in the streets blaming Israel. And from the reports that came out, it wasn't Israel. It was <coughs> a rocket that was... Uh, that was launched uh, from Pal from I mean I guess it was Hamas or it was from Palestine, and uh, it, it was a misfire and uh, it fell into the do hospital. We, do we know that for certain? Yeah, because, there are... because I'm still hearing, uh, you know, both sides, and it reminds me of the old saying: the first casualty of war is the truth. Yeah, well, there's a lot of uh, videos that I've seen, and there's uh, uh, obviously the, the, from the Israeli side, they, 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 they made their intelligence public immediately. But there's a Twitter page that I follow. I think it's something, GPS something. So the, they analyze maps and flight paths and yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, I know stuff. that page, yeah. Uh, and it's pretty cool. So they analyzed exactly with the, with satellite imaging and, and the time that the rocket hit the hospital. And uh, there's a lot of videos from different perspective, uh, perspectives that have come out. And it, it, in fact, shows that there was a, it was a rocket that misfired and that fell exactly at that same time when the hospital was bombed. Um, and, of course, it's sad, right? I mean, we're talking about 500 people that, uh, that, that might have died there, uh, including children, of course. Uh, and, and it's just, you know, these, uh, these sparks that are useless because you have thousands of people that immediately storm the streets all over the world, yeah. including here in Montreal. Uh, in Turkey, they stormed the, the, Israeli, uh, the Israeli embassy. So uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, 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 it's crazy to see how th these things are developing and how uh, obviously sensitive people are to, these, to, to this situation, uh, and especially the Arabs that are living all over the world that are... Uh, uh, supporting the Palestinian people, but everyone is supporting the Palestinian people, and this is what I think isn't highlighted enough. the The distinction between Palestine and Hamas needs to be vocalized a lot more, I think. And this is exactly what we were talking about last episode, um, because people think that when you're supporting the Palestinian cause, automatically you're supporting Hamas, which is not the case. I mean, if you're supporting the attacks that happened in Israel, then it's a whole other story. But we have to be sensitive to the reality uh, in Palestine uh, over the last week. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I really don't know what's going to happen. And uh, It's interesting that we see all these massive demonstrations in the streets of major cities around the world in support of Palestine. But it seems to me that the majority of Western political leaders, including uh, our own Prime Minister and U.S. President Biden, seem to me to be quite unequivocal in their support for Israel. Yes. Like, they, they lament the loss of life on both sides, but when push comes to shove and they have to take a side, and Joe Biden is in Israel right now, yeah. and he said this morning, or yesterday, and I saw this clip on the news before we came over this morning, uh, he was also... Um, he also indicated that it's it's his belief from what he's been told and shown that uh, it was not Israel no. who bombed that hospital. No. See, the, 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 the problem here is that you're going to get into this uh, who said what kind of business, right? And you have the people that are on the other side that are going to argue that oh, it's all propaganda and this is all, you know, uh, it's all made up to, to make it seem like it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's coming from our end. And this is what sucks, right? And this is what you said. You know, the, 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 the truth is what's the most important thing in these conflicts, right? And, uh, and you uh, just don't know. No, the, no, yeah, no. That's, that's such a great expression. I don't, I don't know who said it first, but it's so true. The first, I think it goes back centuries, like von Clausewitz or something. Said, <laughs> the first casualty of war is the truth. And, you know, more than ever, what I appreciate, well, see, it's a double-edged sword because I was going to say that it, it's... It's great to have these social media platforms where you can connect directly with independent journalists that are on the ground and you can get uh, the report uh, straight from what's going on rather than to trusting mainstream media that usually kind of, uh, they got to toe the line, right? I mean, they don't want to, you know, they, they, they want to be careful. And we didn't mention this last week. But there was an email that leaked from some guy up in CBC that is uh, responsible for programming and for content. And in that email, he was uh, announcing to the people at CBC that we are going to be reporting on the, on, on the war, on uh, the language that should be used and what, to say and what not to say. And in that email, he says, please don't refer to Hamas as a terrorist organization. Avoid from using... And, and everyone went, fucking, what, what's going on? What the hell's wrong with you people? How, how can you give that... 
uh, directive, right? Uh, so all this to go back to you know to the fact that you're trying to follow what's happening in uh, on um, on mainstream media, and you just don't know the information you're getting if it's well. Of course, it's truthful. I mean, because they're they're really down the middle. But I don't think you're getting. Um, all the information on our mainstream media, which is why social media has taken up a lot of importance. On the negative side, however, I don't know about you, but my feed has filled up with all these treacherous things and these videos, this uh, the, this footage that they've taken from you know uh, the Hamas uh, terrorists going into these camps and shooting, and it's it's just violent and it's disgusting to watch, right? Yeah, but it's okay. there. I it's mean, it's also really, you know, it's disturbing to me that you know. Nikos from where you know Wisconsin weighs in with you know his information and his opinion. What do I know about that? How do I know what mm. what kind of yeah you know and 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 it used to be you know before social media, um, there was always a loud angry uncle at the dinner table, and when he left, everybody went, oh, "Christ, thank God he went home." <laughs> but now it on social media. You know, some there's people, a bunch of uncles there. Yeah, there's a whole shitload yeah, of loud, people, angry uncles. Yeah, people just spend all day weighing in. Yeah. And, um, you know, I I have a real problem with, you know, there. we all know people who have relatives and family in that area of the world. And those are the people, you know, Al from Wisconsin, I don't really care what he has to say. Or, yeah. you know, Sheila in Michigan, who's going to one demonstration or another. Um, I, you know, it, it's kind of a little bit arrogant to think that you can weigh in, uh, on people who have to hide in safe houses and yeah. shelters. Yeah. yeah. That's why I thought it was important and useful to have Jeff on this show yeah. last week. He brought the perspective of whether you agree with his perspective or not, it has some credibility because he lived there. Yeah. He lived it. So yeah. he knows. We'll see how things develop. Um, what do you guys want to talk about? I want to talk to you guys about, um, well, because you mentioned talk about, about Let's the, talk about Terry's good friend, Justin Trudeau. Oh, geez, man. <laughs> you know, you, 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 the Ted called me as they, uh, Terry was on speakerphone. And, you know, initially I was like, oh, man, how do you feel about us talking about Justin Trudeau? I know you guys are close. And I've said this so many times on this podcast. I know Justin Trudeau personally as well. I, uh, I don't know if he thinks we're friends, but we have, you know, we, we, we used to work together. Uh, the writing that he represents. So if he sees you, he knows, hey, oh, George. Oh, yeah, he's like, hey, yeah, George, what's yeah, going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, like we're on a first name basis. Uh, it's hugs and shit like that, you know? He's I'm, a big hugger. He is a big yeah, hugger. Yeah, he yeah. likes the he hugs. Is, yeah. uh, uh, and, you know, just to, for the people that didn't know, uh, the, the writing that he represents federally, uh, we used to represent it provincially. It's the, well, his is a bit bigger, obviously, because it's federal. Papi we being <coughs> we being Quebec Liberal Party. <coughs> yes, exactly. Yes, Papi Nayau. The, the Papi Nayau. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, so uh, we worked very closely with him. We were there before him, so we got to work with him while he was preparing his uh, his first election. We got to work with his team. We got to work collaborate on a lot of files, especially immigration and refugee files as well. Um, so there was a very good collaboration. We obviously assisted him in all of his campaigns because I feel bad saying this, but you know, locally his team didn't really have the experience uh, necessary to, to 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 organize campaigns because he wasn't usually in his writing. I mean, uh, especially after he became the leader of the party, he was all over the place. Uh, but uh, all this to say that there was a very close relationship with, with him and his team. Uh, and it just feels that uh, ever since he became prime minister, I mean, I'm ready to kind of give him the first two, three years. But after that, it was just a bunch of question marks. Like, where are we going? What is happening here? Do you not see this? How can you be spending so much money? And, and it, it's just trickled down to the point where uh, I, I, hate is a big word. I don't hate anybody. But it's difficult to find it in me to support <laughs> anything he says. That's okay. You know? That's absolutely okay. I, I live, where I live in Langley, British Columbia, I live in fuck Trudeau country. <laughs> uh, so, really? Yeah. Wow. There, there's, you got the t-shirt? Uh, <laughs> I do <The> not. flag? <laughs> but lots of people do. And that, to me is uh, such a display of ignorance and saddens me. You see people driving pickup trucks mm. with fuck Trudeau stickers on the back. Flags, I've seen flags. Flags yeah. waving in the wind and children in the truck. Yeah. And I would like to know how you explain that to your kids. Um, I, one of the things that saddens me 
not just about my friendship with Justin, but about just the political theater overall now is such an ugly pile of shit. People have lost their respect and their sense of decorum when it comes to the office of the president or the office of the prime minister. I remember in my 20s, in my early 30s maybe, meeting uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, the first one, Prime Minister Chrétien, uh, Prime Minister Martin, and the sense that I was standing in front of the prime minister of the country that I love so much, whether I politically aligned with them or not, gave me great joy mm -hmm. and a sense of pride. Yeah. When I got a, one time I got a call from Prime Minister Mulroney, and I couldn't wait to call my parents and say, you'll never guess what just happened. There, that all has disappeared. And I'm sad that because you know this, and I don't, this is how Justin and I became friends. I don't agree with a lot of his positions and his policies. Mm -hmm. But the man that people throw pebbles at and fly flags against is a man who texted my wife every single day while I lay on death's door in the Vancouver General Hospital. I had open heart surgery on January the 3rd, and I succumbed to all manner of infections, and I was on life support for 15 or 16 days. And every day my wife would go to the hospital and not know whether I was going to make it through the night. I was asleep. I was okay. You know, didn't didn't bother me, but it was terrifying for my wife. She got a text every day or every second day from the prime minister. And when the prime minister was in Vancouver, he said to, to Jess, I'd like to come tonight. Is it okay? I would like to see him. Mm -hmm. And he came in. He had a speech to make in and around Vancouver. I think he was in Surrey. He came in the back door so as not to cause a fuss, and he sat. I, I have vague recollections of this, but my wife was so moved. He sat next to my bed on a chair and held my hand and rubbed my hand and spoke to me and said, TD, you've got to fight. There's people waiting for you. You've got to push. Mm. You've got to fight. And that man, that man, that friend who did that, that's who that man is. Yeah. You may hate the carbon tax and hate the wokeness and hate the policies and hate the stuff that he's done and hate the direction the country has gone in. Then go vote and vote him out. Yeah. But the person, the man that I know, the friend that I know, and I became friends with him because when we first got together, I would often say to him, you know what? You're full of shit. <laughs> You're so wrong about that. And he's the kind of guy that you can talk to that way. Yes. Yeah. And and this is and I and this is what's happened to our politics. People have now vilified him and characterized him and turned him into a cartoon character. You know, you see people post uh, videos online of him. You know, he'll be in a line shaking people, taking pictures. And somebody's in lineup going, I'm not fucking shaking your hand, yeah. you piece of shit. Yeah. yeah. Who, who who celebrates that kind? Of, yeah. when, when did we become those people that you celebrate that kind of behavior and you post it proudly, right? As as a as a video. I don't understand it. I really don't get and it it saddens me overall, not just because I'm a good friend of his and he's a good kind decent human being he's a human being he's a father he's a you know he's 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 a person and he's got some political ideas that a lot of people dislike mm -hmm. and i understand that but can't you behave a little yeah it, it, it's crazy to see how and, and i think social media brought this uh, brought this on yeah social media and i also think sorry to interrupt george that some of the wind of what happened down south mm -hmm. in the states has blown up this way. Yeah, for that, sure. That people people have gone, become empowered to behave like complete knobs in public. You know, we've spoken about this with Ted, and because um, uh, I behave like a complete knob <laughs> in public, that's, that's how it came up. George said, "Ted, you got to fucking stop behaving like a complete knob." In no, public. we've we've spoken about this quite a bit. Uh, you know, the the, the point that the, the fact that 
in recent years, we've seen this polarization yeah. um, in politics, right? And uh, I think the, 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 the middle part of the spectrum has kind of di almost disappeared where you're either camped to the right or to the left. Um, and that is reflective also on the policies that our politicians are making because they see they just follow what the crowd wants, right? And that goes to show how Justin Trudeau has also slid the party a little bit more to the left from yeah. where its traditional stance was. But all this to say that we're very polarized. And uh, I, I think that, and I agree with you 100%. And I, I've worked and I've befriended a lot of people in politics, including and politicians. Excuse me again for interrupting, yeah. George, but you, you were in politics, so you know. It's completely thankless. It's 24-7. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. yeah. Seven. yeah, yeah. You never stop. The phone never stops ringing. You need a hard you shell. You yeah. never stop going to the goddamn rubber chicken dinners and fundraisers and taking phone calls from angry people. Whether or not you sit on city council in a small shithole town or you're the prime minister of the country, it never stops. No, never. And I get it. You ran. You wanted that job. Now you've got the gig, yeah, yeah, so yeah. you don't complain. But you know it's a thankless, it nonstop is. It is nightmare yeah. of a job. On it is. Sundays. It is. And if you get into that field and you haven't understood that, then you're either, you know, you either didn't read the fine print or you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong field. Uh, just leave because you're going to, you're going to burn out or you're going to get disappointed or whatever it is. But to go back to what you were saying, I, I get how hard it is. And I, I, I agree with you hundred percent because I've worked with politicians and I, and I've, I'm very close with a lot of them. Uh, and there's very few people that have the, uh, the, 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 the intelligence to divide, to, to, to separate the politician from the person, okay? Uh, and more and more, you know, in the last couple of years. When you see this hatred, which I've never seen, okay? I, I started working in politics in 2007, and there were times where things got really, really rough. I've seen demonstrations like you can't imagine. Uh, but nothing like what I've been seeing the last couple of years where yeah. it's in your face and they're throwing rocks at the prime. Like, I've never seen anything like that. And I get what you're saying. What the hell is wrong with you? He's just a person doing a job, and if you don't agree with it, you have every single right to throw them out next time around. Do that. But I also, probably because of the work that I did, I, I, I love seeing things from different perspectives just so you can get a better understanding. And when I see these things happening, immediately what comes to mind is, how did we get there? Yep. How did we get there? Something <clears throat> must have triggered this behavior from the public to be so hateful because this isn't Canadian culture. And we've spoken about this with Ted. As far back as I can remember, whether it was the liberals or conservatives in power, whether you agreed or not with them, there was always this general sentiment across the country and even in provinces, if we're talking about provincial politics, that there's sound governance in Canada. Regardless of the party, I don't agree with the conservatives or I don't agree with the liberals. At the end of the day, whoever got elected, there was this general sense of respect. Okay, no problem. We're still in good hands, though. We don't agree, and I'm probably not going to vote for you again next time around, but we're going to be okay. It's, you know, we're not, it's not the complete extreme or whatever. That, I believe, in the last couple of years has disappeared. People don't have that trust anymore in government, and nobody can say, you know what, at least we're in good hands in Canada. Uh, everybody cashed the checks. Yeah, yeah. During COVID, everybody cashed the checks. Every, yeah, yeah, I know, but, uh, <laughs> and they like it, right? I mean, it's direct money in your pocket, but I mean, we're looking, you know, at, the, we're looking at the repercussions now of what that yeah, happened, and I, and I understand that it was necessary. No, but A my, lot of people my, also had no choice. Yeah, yeah. But yeah no, and, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that in, in, in a disparaging way, but what I'm saying was, no, in, term, saying that you're terms coming out complaining. in terms yeah. of governance, you know, at the at the time, I, I thought that government kind of steered us through what was an upside down, crazy, yeah. ridiculous. I think time. any government in that position would have done the exact yeah, same thing. Yeah, and, and and everybody, you know, everybody at the time said, "Well, I think they're doing a good job because at least you know I can try and pay my yeah. rent." That's but it goes beyond that, uh, Terry. It goes beyond that. That that was in a situation of emergency and yeah. a crisis where any 
government in place would have done the exact same thing and it would have been justified to spend all that money. I don't think there's anyone that has complained about that direction that Justin Trudeau uh, went through. And not only him, even provincial governments as well. Uh, there's other things, however. And when you're looking at the state of where Canada is internationally, have you ever in your entire life since you've been following politics and from your career uh, on the radio seen a situation where Canada has been so disrespected at an international stage where relations with India were at a humiliating low with I, yeah, China, listen, uh, even with the U.S. Absolutely. I understand that, and, and I don't disagree with that. And my point is, you know, this, this is a kind of conversation for political wonks. You know, Serge, who lives in Boisbriand, who has to go to work every day, I don't think they sit around the table talking about our position on the international stage. You're right. You're That's right. That's what I'm saying. No, no. Ted, you want to say something? Yeah, you. <laughs> George was talking about, um, uh, and you were talking about how the disc the discourse has become so disrespectful. And I've heard you say this before, and I thought it was an interesting uh, perspective. You think there's a Trump factor? I do. I, I do because I think you know there used to be um, there used to be a sense of awe about the Oval Office. Right? No matter who you're, you, you know, whether you liked the president of the United States or not, whether you're Republican or Democrat, didn't matter. If somebody invited you into the White House or the Oval Office, there was a sense of, <gasps> wow, you know, FDR sat in this room. You know, yeah. like there was a whole kind of, you know, I, I think it, 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 the Oval Office was awe-inspiring from a sense of, history and place it in history. commanded respect yeah I agree, you know and you never you you know there was the the pierre trudeau fuddle duddle thing which seems so <laughs> quaint and cute yeah. back in the <laughs> 70s now but now the you know the four what was trump 45th he was 45 yeah. right? <laughs> 45th president of the united states is on a podium somewhere going, and we'll get those motherfuckers <laughs> <laughs> and you just don't picture you know, I, I can't, you know, when you look back at the eloquence of Kennedy or Johnson or even Nixon, you can't imagine that the president of the United States who's supposed to be the, you know, the, the, uh, the paragon of decorum and, and respect and, you know, they play the, ba -ba -ba -da, the hail to the chief when he walks in. But Trump sort of brought um, uh, a kind of behavior where I think some people looked at it and went, oh, well, he's doing that. Yeah. He's, and he's the president of the United States. So yeah. I, I can, I'm going to behave this way to a flight attendant, to yeah. a cashier, to a border guard. You know, like there, there seemed to be kind of a, a breaking of the dam where being an arsehole in public suddenly became, you know, like remember when we were kids, my father would, you know, he'd stop the car and say... Now listen, <laughs> if you embarrass us, I'm going to drag you, you back in this warning. car. If you don't behave, yeah. you know. You if, kids pipe down back there. And, it, and if you dared misbehave in the supermarket, my mother would leave a bag, you know, a, a cart full of groceries and say, that's it. By the ear. Yeah. And <laughs> they didn't so care about embarrassing you. Ear. So there was, there was, um, um, an unwritten rule about public behavior. Yeah. You didn't behave that way in public. Yeah. You know, you, you, you just didn't behave that way. And I think my, my personal theory is, and I've got no proof for it, but my think, my, my, I think that Trump kind of unleashed a, oh, well, okay, I, so now I'm going to behave like an arsehole yeah, in public. Yeah, he, he normalized. Yeah, that, that kind that of, behavior. of behavior. Like, yeah. you know, the day that Ro that Justin had rocks thrown at him, I texted him right away and I said, "Please, please listen to your team. Listen to your security team, because yeah, it was just pebbles." And he told me, and I won't even repeat what the people were yelling about his wife. Yeah, yeah. Like just the most vile, vile things yeah. about his wife, and then flinging rocks at yeah, him. Yeah. That you know, 
hey, come tweet tabernacle. Yeah. Like, but know. there's also the sense of the clip, eh? Because this is the era that we live in now, right? Everything happens online, and you want the clip. And to a certain extent, it's all strategy as well. You want to paint the, the the your opposition as the bad guy. And I get what he's doing. Let me go in front of these guys, antagonize them or whatever, and you, George, you're going to see the flags, you're going to see them I, swearing, I don't, I don't and agree. that paints your adversary he's, he's in the, the negative light as well. the the country. When he goes into a crowd, he's not trying to antagonize people. Well, no, because you know that they're hating, they, they, they no, hate no, no, you. No, Why would you well, put your life at no, risk? It goes back to what you're saying about the rocks. But there are people in the crowd... There are people in the crowd who are good and decent people That's true, yeah. who want to meet the prime minister. Mm -hmm. There's always one or two or ten Well, there's more than just one or two right? these days. I, but I, I, yeah. why should those bullies, and he probably, I'm not, you know, I don't mean to put words in his mouth, but why should those bullies stop him from interacting? Like, no, no. like it or not, there is, there is a chunk of the Canadian population that still likes him. So why shouldn't, oh, he, a be lot. Able, why shouldn't he be able to go meet those people? You're 100% right. I'm just looking from the perspective of his security to go back to what you are saying before. Yeah, I... Do you need to do that, dude? Like, you don't know how crazy people are today. No, 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 I know, but... The, the do you remember? Do you remember? The, I can't remember I can't George, remember. the pebble thing happened during the election. Yeah, yeah but do you remember that same election? So you, he was going around with a bulletproof vest. Yeah, because listen, well, I told you where I live, where I live in the Fraser Valley is Fuck Trudeau com yeah. country. And when I got out of the hospital, I was in the hospital for 31 days. I got a text from him saying, I have to give a speech tonight. I'll be in the neighborhood. Can I come and see you? Yeah. And when the. Uh, RCMP found out my address because they have to. They got scared. <laughs> you well, can't they, go didn't, in there. they didn't get scared, but they brought extra people with them. Yeah. And to me, as a Canadian, that's very sad. It is. It, it is because you can't. You, you, we shouldn't resort to that. No. But it, it is the reality, and I, I know for a fact that even from the first day when he became prime minister, and especially in the beginning. He would completely neglect the advice that his security detail was giving him. Yeah, I know. And, and it was a big problem in the PMO. Yeah. I remember uh, going to the the the, the first um, a Greek parade that he was the prime minister, and he goes every year because it's in his writing. Um, and the first time that he was, because he 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 would attend before when he was an MP. We used to march together, and everything was nice and dandy and normal and whatever. And then the day that he became, from the moment that he became prime minister. There's snipers on rooftops, and I was like, what the hell is going on here? I mean, it's not that bad. I mean, it's Park X. Everyone loves him. They think he's a god, Yeah, but, but they can't risk that. That's yeah. their job to you, protect him. You, you know this better than anybody. That's not, that's not the prime minister's decision. No. His security detail decides what kind of security. Have you seen how big his security detail is uh, yeah. these days? It's, it's disgusting. Yeah. You guys wanna, it's necessary. You guys want to hit up some news? Oh, is, we, we are. To, what are we doing? Oh, I thought. Oh, is it, do you guys have oh, no, a news anchor? The, no, no. Do you, some, and now the ten thirty news. No, because some of the cause some some of the stuff Ted sent in. That's why. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, no. Oh, wait, so is this the way this? I'm I'm unfamiliar with these uh, these uh, these uh, internet uh, uh, morning shows. You, you, no, no, no. You guys. Uh, People uh, wander in and out of the studio, and and, <laughs> and, and but then, but then it ends yes. at eleven o'clock. Is that the way it works? Are we on yet? <laughs> 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 Have we started? <laughs> but it is just to wrap up on the Trudeau thing. Um, yeah. I know that it's not easy for him, and uh, to me, sometimes I just, you know, that clip that you're saying where the guy's like, "I'm not gonna shake your hand, fuck off, hey, you ruin the country," and it shows that he's going to support the people that are there to that want to meet the prime minister, and he just falls on that one nut over there. I just think that given the context of the hatred and the animosity that exists out there, if I were in his shoes. I would be so much more careful. I'd want everything to just be double checked. You don't know how psycho the other person is. Yeah, but then you don't know him well because he he's a, he will not be. Oh no, no, I he know. He doesn't be, back down. No, he yeah, doesn't yeah, yeah. back down. He won't be bullied. He won't. And and he he enjoys the job and considers it part of the job to interact with the. Uh, you know what he would say. He about. loves that. I know that, yeah. and I've seen him, and yeah. I, and I've seen him uh, work uh, the ground. Um, I don't know. Uh, lately, I've been so upset, and there's just so many things happening, and we're. Uh, maybe it's just me because I think of things that regular people, like you said, don't really care about. Um, Hi, Ted. Before we go on, and as an aside, and for the sake of comic relief, 
when you started to do Hail to the Chief. <laughs> da, 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 yeah. Hail to the... It reminded me of that movie from, I don't know how many years ago, it might be 30 years ago now, with James Garner and Jack Lemmon. I think the name of the movie was The American President's Plural, or something like that. Rings a tiny bell. Jack Lemmon and James Garner were both former U.S. presidents. And I think Dan Aykroyd played the current U.S. president, and, okay. he, and he was he was not a good man, and he was up to something, and James Garner and Jack, Nichols, uh, Jack Lemmon's Lemon. character ended up um, uh, exposing and defeating whatever evil plot Dan Aykroyd's character had. Anyway, there was one point in the movie where James Garner and Jack Lemmon are sitting around, and uh, they're just having a casual conversation, and they're talking about Hail to the Chief and how they had their own words to it. <laughs> and one of them goes, yeah, I used to sing uh, Hail to the Chief, he's the chief, and he needs hailing. <laughs> And the other guy goes, oh, yeah? He said, mine was, uh, hail to the chief. If you don't, I'm going to kill you. I often wondered if, if, if when the president got back upstairs to the, uh, the residence, if as he was undressing, he was going, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know how songs get stuck in yeah. your head? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. That was a great movie, and I think it would stand the test of time. Uh, the American Presidents, I believe it was called The American Presidents, James Garner and Jack Lemmon, who are both, they both must be gone. By yeah, I'm sure if you bing that, you'll find it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that I, that used to make me laugh so hard. Hail to the chief. He's the chief and he needs hailing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about language. I know that that's the reason oh, you good. left Montreal. Language, yay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but, you know, no, because we've spoken about this so many times. Uh, and, you know, we're going to move over to provincial politics where, you know, there's been this sentiment of nationalism and i think it's fair to say that that's you know premier legault completely won based on those grounds here in quebec he's he he did even better in the second election um he he's won over all the regions specifically based on that nationalist uh, ideology that he's the protector of whatever is french uh and uh there was always these danger this this danger that legislation was going to come out from it that was going to have an impact specifically uh, in cities like Montreal or Laval or uh, you know Sherbrooke or you know the the big the bigger uh, cosmopolitan areas in in, in Quebec uh, and last Friday which is like a dick move you know like you guys know how the media works you, if you make an announcement if the government makes an announcement on a friday yeah. you know that you don't want it to, 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 to a, yeah a you don't want friday it to catch afternoon announcement. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. You know yeah. right? and the announcement that was made it was from his uh higher education minister uh yeah, yeah higher education minister uh pascal derry who announced that uh as of 2024 so as of the next school uh semester or the next school season the english the anglophone universities uh, are going to have to charge almost double tuition to all foreign students or out of Quebec students. Um, and the reason for that is they believe that there's this imbalance uh, and this inequity in, in, f- in, in, in funding. And they want to take that difference that they're going to collect from these uh, from these universities and use it to fund the francophone universities. And all hell has broken loose, obviously, because... First of all, it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, and uh, I mean, doubling the tuition already out of province students and international students, they pay uh, close to about twenty thousand uh, dollars a year, twenty twenty five thousand dollars a year, uh, depending on the program and all that stuff. So raising it. Uh, so, so what they're doing, they're putting kind of like a, a minimum. So from nine thousand uh, dollars. Sorry, did I say twenty? Uh, uh, this is what it is now. So there, it was nine thousand dollars, and they're raising it to seventeen for out of province students, and they're raising it to twenty for international students. Still now, a pretty good deal, though, no? For the government, it's, it's fantastic. But here's the thing: people think that that's what that that's what the tuition is going to be, but that's not the case. This is what the government is going to come and take. This is their share. We're going to take 9000 from your out-of-province students and 20000 from your international students. Obviously, the university needs to, 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 to take care of these services. So it's not going to be $17,000 for an out-of-province student to come study in Quebec. It's going to be way more than that because that's the part that they just need to give to the government. So obviously, now this has had already uh, repercussions. People have come out against that. It makes absolutely no sense well, at it, all. It makes sense from the point of view of what has been uh, the favorite political dog to kick in 
Quebec since 1976, and that's the English community. And they're running out of ways to kick the English community. They've, you know, they've done the signs, they've done the schools, they've done the, uh, you know, the, this litany of there's always another way. It's how can we fire up our base by blaming something on the English community? You know, when I was a kid, the English community was part of the Quebec society that helped build Quebec society. And the English community began to become vilified starting in in the days of Bill 101. And I'm, I'm a Bill 101 supporter. I think it was necessary. So am I. Yeah. Um, but that's where it began. And I think now, at this point, you know, I'm very, very cynical about it. I think to myself, the government has a caucus meeting and goes, okay, well, what can we do now? <laughs> like, what? how can we blame the English for something now? Mm. And somebody said... You know, McGill's very popular around the world. Maybe we can scoop some money and disguise it as, no, 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 we're just going to raise the tuition to make it fair and equitable according to other tuitions so we can give money to the French schools mm. so that we can, you know, because French education has been neglected. Has it? University de Montréal, you can? Yeah. Has it? They have a very good reputation internationally. For the people that are watching that don't know, uh, oh. just to... You know, put, put them into context. The, the, the Quebec government finances higher education, including universities. So for the Quebec students, there's a, there's a certain standard that they need to follow. But for foreign students, including yeah. out-of-province students, that's deregulated. So the government has no say in that, okay? Uh, and because of the reputation that McGill has had internationally, Concordia as well, and there's also Bishop's University yep. uh, close to Sherbrooke, uh, they attract a lot more foreign students. Yeah, and because reputation. there's no regulation, yeah. I mean, it's, it's supply and demand, and they've been able to set a price where it, 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 they have set themselves aside financially from the French universities. And that's not to say that the French universities suck, because you mentioned the University of Montréal, there's UCAM, uh, there's the Polytechnique. We have great French yeah. universities yeah. over here. Now, the idea of raising the tuition to the Anglophone universities and that idea making it better for the French universities, I don't think is a good thing. When you have out of uh, province or foreign students that come to study over here, it's like telling them, okay, well, look, you're coming to study in Quebec. Here are your options, okay? You can go and study to a French university, and this is what you're going to pay. Or you can uh, go to the English university and pay fucking triple or whatever the price is going to be. The foreign student coming in obviously won't go study to the, uh, at the French university because they don't speak French. It's as simple as that. So they're just going to turn around and leave. So this is yeah. clientele that we're, that we're going to lose uh, in Quebec. But they don't care. I don't think they... You know what, George? No, I, I, I don't I, think I, they care either. I don't this think is purely care. ideological. It's, you know, when you talk, you, you talk to nationalists, and I say, you know, in 1977, half a million English people left. No, they didn't. And it hurt the economy. No, it didn't. So to me, when I heard this story about, you know, from British Columbia, I was watching TV with my wife, and I said, oh, look, another language law. They, yeah. You know? And I, my wife said to me, that plus a change. Yeah. C'est la même chose tout le temps. Et yeah. plus ça change. Yeah. And you and I know, and the three of us, four of us in this room all know, on a regular basis, no one gives a shit. We all get along. We all talk to each other. But it's the government, and everything that they do, especially if it's a nationalist government like the CAC, French English, French English, French English, French English. We're all Quebecers. Because the numbers just don't make sense to me. The no, minister, well, the minister, no. the minister that came out specifically said, "Well, they come here, they study is it to the so they come, they study at a rebate, and yeah. then they all leave." Can you give us figures? How many leave? Do they all leave? like a hundred percent of these foreign students yeah. all leave? Can we have figures? Because I don't think that they all leave. In fact, Concordia came out and said half of their international students actually stay in Quebec because they have uh, this uh, co-op program where they can match them with businesses. So a lot of them actually do remain here. And then the other thing that Legault uh, came out and said, I think Monday uh, the, uh, or Tuesday, I can't remember, uh, yesterday, he said that um, I will not be the prime minister that will uh, see the French language um, 
uh, disappear. And there you go. This is and that's the key thing. That's the key thing. Yeah. Last night, Ted and I were down downtown uh, near Ontario and St. Catherine Street East, and we got caught in a traffic jam because something was happening. Somebody was letting out. And it's it probably was, the demonstrations of the Palestinians. No, 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 no. Uh, okay. yeah, some, uh, it might have been the new Much Music uh, documentary. Okay, and there were just there were hundreds and hundreds of university age kids walking down past the car. We had the windows open. Beautiful night. All of them speaking English. Yeah, all of them, and that's because they all come from somewhere else. And I think there's a lot of ministers in the government who don't like the sound of that. They don't want more English people here, and that's what's going to happen. It's anecdotal. I've got a friend of mine that lives in South Carolina. He was from here. We were both born and raised here. His daughter wants to come to McGill. She was about to apply for McGill, and he got the word of the change, and that's off. She's not coming. Yeah. And, and so job done. So just it's less English people here. And, and, and it's sad to see because, okay, we're listening to Prime Minister, and he wants to protect the French language. I think that's fine. I, uh, I'm, I'm a product of Bill 101 yeah, and actually support it. It's at the expense of the English. But, but that's the, this is the thing. How... Because I read an article where foreign students, including out of province and obviously international students, for Concordia, McGill, and bishops, account for about 35,000 students every year. Mm -hmm. Is the prime minister really telling us that the decline of the French language is caused by 35,000 people in, in, in all of the province? Like sure. out of 8 million people, it's the 35,000 that are going to cause the decline of your language? It just does not make any sense. And everyone is thinking that the government is paying so much more to have these students here as if they don't contribute. And you have the president of the Montreal Chamber of Commerce that came out yesterday, and he said that that is complete bullshit because every single uh, okay, student from, I'll just read the, exactly what he said, student from other provinces and other countries who study at Concordia McGill contribute about $520 million annually to Montreal's economy, not including, this has nothing to do with the tuition. Um, and of that $520 million annually, $325 million is from international students. So the breakdown is $325 and $195 from out-of-province students. We're talking about half a billion dollars a year that these students bring to the economy. What are you doing? Damn. How like how is that? And that's and a lot of money. It's it, of course it's a lot of money. And this is every year, and I'd love to see some sort of study that proves that thirty five thousand international uh, students are causing the decline of the French language. And if that's the case, then as the government, what are you putting in place instead of kicking them out? Because that's exactly what is happening. So instead of doing that, what measures are you putting in place not only to keep them here but to help them with their francisation? Okay, they're coming to an English university. That's fine. Accept it because these are world-class universities. Uh, so rather than closing the door and the exposure that these universities are giving your province to the world, how about you put in place a program that once they're done, they can stay like Concordia is doing. They have a co-op program. Half of them, according to what they say, end up staying. So figure out a way as the government not only to make them stay but to incorporate, uh, incorporate them in like this accelerated French uh, uh, learning uh, program or whatever, so they can immerse themselves into the French culture. Or I think that would have been a much better approach than to just say, ah, f fuck off. And, and the, <laughs> but that's what it is. That's what it is. Yeah, it's, it's, and maybe it's going to be, it's, and maybe it's gonna be a bit of, less of a problem for McGill and Concordia, but Bishops yeah. is risking to shut down completely. I too, so, but to the government, it's um, attack the English, play to your base, we don't give a shit. Because everybody knows, you know, they garner most of their support and most of their votes Outside Montreal. from the whole rest of the province. So they don't give a shit. They, and, and, and attacking anything English, institutionally or otherwise, it plays to their base. Yeah. I just want to see here uh, some comments about this because for sure... Uh, on the live chat, yeah, what do you, you have the live chat. We got the live chat. Yeah. The yeah. live yeah. chat, yeah. Yeah. Captain, Captain Yolo. The country would be in a far better place if all Canadians are functionally bilingual. I don't disagree with that. Stephen Murray, I find it funny that the loudest people in the language debate that cry the most that the English language is killing French can't write a proper French sentence properly. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, the mountain is Quebecois. <laughs> um, I just fear, and this is what we were saying before, that we're drifting away actual political policy that can make a difference in people's lives, and we're veering into populism uh, and to ideology. And that's what works these days, and you got to give it to Legault 
He's scoring points with it. He's completely taken over the regions. Well, it's what we were talking about before, even at a municipal level. Yeah. Here's your bamboo forks. <laughs> Here's, I, I, I was sorry to keep going on about this, but it's the premise is the same. Instead of running the city and seeing that the city runs functionally for its citizens, I'm going to be busy doing the ideology, little, yeah. the ideology projects that I believe are important, and I'm going to help save the world. Oh, you're stuck in traffic? Too bad. I'm busy saving yeah. the world. Never mind that, practicality. That's here's, not, your, here's your ideological that, fast yeah, food. That's not the purview of government used to be service to the people, and now it's, no, I got a bigger idea. We're going to put patios in the middle of the street. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> but what about the, yeah, no, we're, you know, it's our, you know, and I get it, I'm not a climate change denier or anything like that, but I just believe, especially at the municipal level and the provincial level, like you say, it shouldn't be about ideology. It should be about service to the people that voted you into government. Yeah, you're the front line. Yeah. You're the you're the front line, especially the municipal. Um, but I, yeah. I, every time this sort of thing comes up, especially the language debate, I, I there's this fear that comes up because, uh, you know, it, it's a distraction from what really matters. Yeah, and what absolutely. really matters right yeah. now is the health service that is going yes. to shit. Yes. Uh, housing that has gone to shit. Yeah. Uh, you know. Where are we going to put everybody? Cars. People can't afford cars anymore. Well, they don't want you to drive a car anyway. Well, there so you go. That's yeah. the that's the most important thing. But it's all it's been the same thing. My very first election, I was eligible to vote for the first time in 1976. And what were that we was talking? The first PQ government. Yep. The first, yeah. Yep. And what were we talking about in 1976? Separation, nationalism, referendums, language. But that's always been the case. It's never yeah, gone yeah, away. Never, it, it's, it's what I mean. I mean, the but first when ever... Is, yeah. When is society going to move forward and say, I think I think we have a kind of a balance here, so let's let's talk about the health care system. Yeah. But it doesn't play with voters. I think it's part of our culture. I mean, the first debate ever in the National Assembly of Quebec was what language are the <laughs> are the debates going to happen in in parliament you know it's that was the first it, ever debate it's in a, parliament it's an interesting society uh, where people still get angry about the plains of abraham that was a long time ago <laughs> <laughs> they have uh, good concerts there now yeah, apparently it's a great yeah. they had planes back then yeah. Planes, yeah, they flew. Yeah. 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 The planes of Abraham. It's a, uh, it was the original Israeli state it was airline. This, yeah, it was this huge uh, aviation uh, mogul that had a bunch of planes. Uh, no, no, but there's a lot. Uh, who who came? Was it Metallica that came in the summer? There's a huge festival. Uh, that Metallica. Yeah, they have a big there. festival yeah. there every McCartney summer. McCartney has I think. played there. Yeah. It's uh, it's. Yeah, it's a it's nobody uh, complains about English when Metallica and McCartney play no. there, do they? And you know what? I'm an English guy, and one of the most emotional things I've ever seen was Celine and Jeanette Renault on the Plains of Abraham. I'll okay. never forget it. Yeah. Mm. Before we go, are we going soon? soon I think soon. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm to bring it up for people. The video and everything. Yeah, um, uh, I would talked earlier about the movie with Jack Lemmon and James Garner as the American president. My fellow Americans, it was thank called. you. Okay, and I found the YouTube clip. This is a shot in the dark. I, I just I haven't listened to it, but it, on right. YouTube it said, um, "Hail to the chief." So I assume I assume okay. this is the scene, and I hope the quality, I hope the sound quality. Yeah, give me uh, just it, one it, second, it, John. Okay. You don't remember that movie, Tara? I, I think do, I, I remember I, you saying yeah, singing, yeah. "Hail yeah. to the chief." He's the chief, and he needs hailing. <laughs> It's kind of catchy. I, I was, think it was you who first pointed it out. I was to still me. like, I'd love to ask a president that. Do you hum the yeah. the chief? <laughs> well, this is this is a great this just, is a great little uh, just spoof. the scene of him getting spoof dressed. Yeah, yeah, but you, do, do, do. you know what was song? Are you ready, stuck kids? in your head? <laughs> and they were two. <laughs> these guys were two such great actors, such great actors, great actors A and and great comedy chops B. We're ready, kids. Please, I'm trying to sleep over here. Sleeping too much is a sign of depression. Yeah, well, you keep whistling and I'll put a depression in your skull. We've got damn near eight hours before we get to the library. I'm just trying to stay alert. Well, I hate that song. So do I. <laughs> I made up words to the damn thing. What? I made up words to hail to the chief. I sing them to myself every time they play it. I made up words to it, too. Yeah, let me hear yours. <laughs> now you go first. No, no, you do yours and I'll sing mine. 
Hail to the chief, he's the chief and he needs hail. <laughs> he is the chief, so everybody hail like crazy. Hail to the <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's hear your version, Gershwin. No. Well, what do you mean, no? I sang mine. I know, you're an idiot. <laughs> Jack Lemmon had the best delivery, <laughs> yeah. didn't he? Yeah. He really yeah. did, yeah. Yeah, I guess they, obviously a... they cut that short before yeah. I hail to the chief. If you don't, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> he's uh, he's such a fantastic actor. Oh, my God. Uh, both uh, comedically yeah. and in serious uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. dramatic yeah. Great roles. Great actors. Yeah. God rest their souls, both of them. Yeah. Uh, did you watch the the first game uh, at the at the Bell Center? Because uh, I thought the I, I Chicago saw your game. I saw your I tweet, I think, yeah. or Facebook, and I'm I, I don't I didn't watch. I'm like, why the fuck would they be booing Connor Bedard? Because according to the the high priests of hockey, <coughs> who uh, who know uh, who know everything about hockey, when they boo a visiting player, it's a sign of respect. That's such bullshit. I've never that, heard well, that before. Yeah, well, that's what that's I, interesting. Yeah, that's what I say. It's bullshit. I just thought it was. You know, the so-called sophisticated Montreal hockey fans, this 18-year-old kid who's going to be the next big thing in hockey comes into town, and they boo him just because he's an 18-year-old kid who's going to be the next big thing. I don't think it's a sign of respect. I think it's callous and boorish behavior. Absolutely. Um, but Fanaticism. It's good. And, you know, everybody was wishing that we would have got, we would have had him. Yeah, of course. I mean, had we, we had the, the Canadians, first pick. The Canadians had the first pick overall. They mi missed it by that much. Yeah. They had the first pick overall last year, and it wasn't Bedard's draft year. This year yeah. it was, and Chicago got him. How's he doing? Has he uh, has he scored yet? Uh, yeah, yeah, he scored. He's yeah. got I don't know uh, how many points he's got, but he's I you know I watched him that night and he was a force to be reckoned with seems on like the a, ice. Seems like a nice and level headed kid too. He, yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah. It's and he's yeah, it's yeah, he's going to be a big yeah, big, big star. star. Yeah. That's what's exciting about uh, you, you know in general in sports when you have these up and coming talents and you, they get all this buzz even before they start and we saw him in the juniors and all that stuff. Um, to be there in place to see that development yeah. and to see how he's gonna uh, grow we, as a player over 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 time. That's uh, that's exciting. We had Michael Farber on the uh, got Michael Farber, uh, Sports Illustrated, the Gazette columnist. Um, uh, you've heard him and seen him on TSN TV and radio. Um, and we had that conversation with him. He'll be one of our guests on standing by this new season. And we were talking about just what you're saying, George. We've been very lucky. We've been in an era where we got to watch, at least at my age, I got to see Jean Beliveau, Guy Lafleur, Wayne Gretzky, Sidney Crosby, uh, Connor David, Bobby Mario Orr. Le Bobby Orr. These are generational talents, mm. and they seem to come along once every two or three or four years. And we've been lucky enough to watch them mature and play. And the other thing is, the career goes by like that. It goes by so fast. I remember when everybody was excited about Sidney Crosby, and now Sidney Crosby's trying to get... People just stopped calling him old. He's thirty six. <laughs> yeah, something. he's an old. Yeah. He's the yeah. old man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But he's still fantastic. Oh to yeah, watch. absolutely. Yeah, uh, incredible. Talents. Ovechkin is another name. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, the, Ovechkin's the guy with a with a realistic shot at Gretzky's record. Yeah, I which record so, yeah. is that? Eight hundred ninety four career goals. Yeah. I don't know where Ovechkin is, but I know he's got an outside shot. Can you look at, at his uh, yeah. goals? Jaromir Jagar is another <laughs> one. Yeah. He's still playing in Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's he'll, yeah. he'll be like my dad. He'll yeah, be play, exactly. He'll yeah. be Terry's hockey. dad played hockey yeah. well into his eighties. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Jaromir Jagar will that play. Eight hundred twenty-two. Eight hundred twenty-two. So and and what's he's the record? Eight ninety-four. Eight ninety-four. So he would have to have so ninety-four minus twenty-two is eight hundred and thirty-nine. That's right. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> he's got to score another seventy-something goals. There right? you go. Yeah, and that's and not, that's at his age, at his age. Well, no, it is. Feasible. Not in one season, like if no, you, not like in one in two season, seasons. But yeah, he could. You split that over two or yeah, three seasons. And Ovechkin is Ovechkin's a good enough player. Yeah. He can last for another enough two three athlete. Years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless he throws his back out. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but <laughs> he's I don't a fucking think he's tough guy. Yeah, he's yeah. never. He may have had long-term serious injuries in his career. I don't know off the top of my head, but he's not prone to them. Right. And he keeps himself in great shape. And he's just one of those, you know marvelous physical specimens who continues to compete at an elite level uh in his late 30s i think he's 30 he's he was drafted the year before gretzky um uh crosby uh, oh so, weren't they drafted together no 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 okay. uh one of them was uh 2005 and one was 2006 or 2004 2005 anyway he's got he could he could do it he could do it and i'm hoping that he does i'd like to see it happen 
because I don't think Ovechkin has ever, when you mention the all-time greats, the all-time greats, and it just happened with us now, he was an afterthought. Yep. And I think a lot of it has to do with where he played, Ted. Washington, yeah. yeah he didn't so. play in a, yeah. in a major hockey market, that's yeah. for sure. Well, mind you, Pittsburgh's not a major hockey market, but we always think of Lemieux and we think of Crosby. True. But he's won a cup, no? Uh, Washington? Yeah, yeah. Think, uh, yeah. He got so he's... drunk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He got I think so should... drunk. Has, has he won one or two? One. One, he's one eh? yeah. The Capitals well, have won the, one cup. better than nothing. Uh-huh. One saying? more than me. I think we're going <laughs> to close on this. Uh, Will Ovechkin beat, uh, what was the other guy's name? Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> yeah, the Wayne Gretzky. Uh, Bob Fishman. <laughs> What's that other guy? Who? <laughs> 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 All, right. All right, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. What a special episode we had. Uh, follow us on all uh, social media platforms. You can follow Poseidon at Poseidon69 or I am Poseidon.com. That's has a my website. website. Uh, Patreon.com slash Pantelis for exclusive content and everything and the, the entire back catalog of everything that's produced here. Standing by the Terry and Ted podcast coming next week. New episodes week. in the works. Uh, that's super exciting. You can follow me on the Backstage Podcast or if you know and understand French, Politiquement Parlant. Um, and that's every week as well. Hey, quoi? Hey. <laughs> yeah. Also, <laughs> uh, if, you, if you guys enjoyed this, don't forget to subscribe and leave a like and a comment. Uh, we accept everyone's opinion unless you are a flat earther. <laughs> I think that thanks for having me, guys. Oh, such a pleasure. Thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna be sharing this clip with everyone. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you guys. Bye. Take care. We'll see you all next week. Ciao, boys.